Hello and welcome to the Global Slovakia podcast, where we explore Slovakia's past, present and future. In this series, we look at the destinies of the brave Slovak men and women who dared or were forced to leave Slovakia in search of a better life abroad. Are you Slovak? Do you want to connect to your heritage? Follow us on Facebook or globalslovakia.com. Hello, I'm David Grega. Today we're joined by Father Matthew to talk about his family Slovak connection and share with us some of his fascinating story. Hello, Father Matthew. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate it. Can you give us just a little overview of your family's Slovak connection story? Yes. On my mother's side of the family, all four of her grandparents came from the old kingdom of Hungary. They were Slovaks from there and uh, came to the United States in the end of the, the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, and settled all in a small little coal patch town in Carbon County, Pennsylvania. So they all made their way during that great wave of immigration, and her mother's parents and her father's parents, they married over here, as a matter of fact, all four of them. Okay, thank you. Maria Hager, she was sort of one of the key figures in your story. Can you tell us a little bit more about her life and the course that she took? Yes, she is my great-grandmother. She's my mother's mother's mother. She came from a small village of uh, Fintice in the Sharish region, just northeast of Presho. The village is still there, people still living there. Family house is still there. She was the second surviving of the many children that her parents had. Her brother Ludwig, Ludovic was the oldest. She was next who survived. And both of them came and eventually her youngest sister, Frantiska, also came to the United States. And she came in uh, 1910, in September of 1910. Uh, and in a very short time, in I think it was just a little more than a month, she married my great-grandfather, uh, Josef Bunyowski who was also from the village of Incice, but had come three years earlier than she did to the States. That's great. That's wonderful. Going back to Maria and coming to America and marrying for the first time, she underwent a bit of adversity early in her adult life. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes. When she and my great-grandfather, Zedo Yosef, got married in uh, 1910, they had five children from between 1912 and 1919. And then he died very young at the age of 30 in uh, 1921, in June of 1921. So he worked in the mines. She had five children. What support was there? You know, there was uh, probably something from one of the Slovak fraternal societies, which were in essence self-insurance to help people pay a death benefit so that someone could have a coffin to be buried in, buy a plot and have a headstone and maybe a little left over for any other expenses. But as far as I know, she was in the home with her five children. So that was an adverse time, I'm sure, for her from June of, of 1921. And then she remarried on February 14th of 1922 to Jan Kutny from Vaniškovce, which is not too far from Fintice. So he also worked in the mine. So there was another breadwinner in the family to help support, in the end, seven children, because she had a son and a daughter with him. He worked in an anthracite mine. A lot of those workers developed a coal miner's lung. Did he succumb to that because of what he was doing? He probably, even at that age, because when he came over in 1907, he had been working in the mines for about uh, 14 years. He probably did have coal miner's asthma, black lung, but... My mother's father had it. My father's father had the coal miner's asthma, the black lung, uh, you know, which so many uh, uh, of the men who worked in the mines did develop over time. Uh, I know my mother said that he died of a kidney ailment and another cousin had said it was diabetes, but those two things kind of still fit together. You know, we never found a death certificate to say for sure. This is only what's been handed over in the family telling of his death. I wanted to talk a little bit more, going back to Maria, and Maria's, her great-grandfather was originally from Bavaria, correct? Uh, yes, doing research, and 
Knowing the name Hager, it's spelled H O umlauts G E R, and in America it was pretty much Americanized as H A G E R. It's not a Slovak sounding name because it isn't, it's a German name. <laughs> and her great grandfather, uh, Friedrich Christoph Hager, was a uh, German Lutheran from Bavaria. I mean, Bavaria is very Catholic, and he was a Lutheran from Regensburg. And he came to the village uh, as a master carpenter to work for the local count, to do carpentry work for him. He married, his first wife was also Lutheran from the area, and she died within a matter of months, and he married his second wife. And uh, within a matter of about 30 years, his descendants had become Slovak and Catholic and stayed there and uh, adapted and became Slovaks. Was he also the carpenter that actually produced some pews that are still used in the church back there? Yes. As a matter of fact, when my family and I went back in 2017 to go visit the ancestral village and we met many of our Hager cousins for the first time in person, they took us to the parish church. Uh, the sacristan's also a cousin along the Hager line. He let us in and they showed us these beautifully uh, carved pews that my great-grandmother's, her great-grandfather had carved and said that was the only thing that remained of the work he had done because there had been so many fires in the manor house any of the cabinetry work he had done was destroyed but in the church the pews that were carved by him uh, are still there and still used in the village church when they have services there every weekend even on weekdays they have masses there still that must have been pretty emotional going there and actually going into that church and seeing and and sitting in the pews that he uh, carved Oh, it, it certainly was. Some of the uh, most memorable photographs that we took there were of my cousins there who stayed in the area, and there they are praying in those pews as we were visiting the church there. So that that was very special to, to be able to make that trip, and unexpected in a way. I didn't know how the trip was going to turn out, where we were going to go, because the family over there took charge of everything, and we just followed along. Whatever they wanted us to do, we did. And Maria also was a garment worker, right? Uh, that was my mother's mother, Gazella. She worked in the, in the garment industry, which was also very well established in the area. So there was the coal mining for the men, and there were many garment working factories where they would sew. But my mother's father and her mother, you know, they both worked outside the home when my mother was little. So she was, in essence, till she went to school, raised by her grandparents. My maternal grandfather's mother and father, and then my Zero Jan and Baba Maria, that uh, she was raised by, by them. So much so, they only spoke Slovak in the home. And my mother told me when she was going in first grade, she almost didn't make it because she didn't know enough English. <laughs> that she spoke Slovak so much as a child that she didn't know English well enough. So she you know, did get into first grade, but that was by dint of, of her being raised by her great grandparents while her father and mother were both out working during the day. Right. Along those lines, in Lansford, Pennsylvania, there was a particular church, was it St. Michael's, that was a key part of your story. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, it was founded in 1891 by the late Monsignor William Heinen, who himself was from Germany. But he became something of an apostle to the Slovak Catholics in eastern Pennsylvania, founding scores of Slovak Catholic parishes there as a circuit rider priest, in essence. And that parish was begun in 1891, and it became a home for Slovaks and people from Slovenia and Croatia, you know, from Austria-Hungary. And that became a focal point spiritually and also culturally because of the, the ability for them to use their language with one another and the hymns that were sung in church. Even when the Mass was in Latin, there still would be hymns that could be sung in Slovak. This is a large part of the passing on of the Slovak traditions and culture. A lot of it's centered around that and particularly the traditional foods sometimes associated with the major holidays, you know, Christmas and Easter and, and others, but also the, the hymns who would sing. Was it your mother that played the organ and, and sang? Yes, you know, at home we had a small console organ and she loved to play and sing hymns, Slovak hymns and even Slovak folk songs. We had records that we would play and, and sing 
And when there were festivals at the church, we would sing folk songs and various songs at Christmas and Easter. And throughout the year, I know the Feast of St. Anna in July, there was a certain hymn that we would sing for, for her feast day. And I remember for both my mother's parents at their funerals, we sang specific hymn to the mother of God. And another hymn that is sung in, at the funeral was sung in Slovak and at the grave because they were being lowered into the grave. And this was in 1982 and 1985, respectively. So uh, tradition was still being carried on there. And certainly my children, they know Tansui, Tansui, and some of the other uh, Slovak folk songs, because I like to sing and listen to the music and uh, share it with them. And they enjoy it. You know, they enjoyed the trip when we, we got to go to Slovakia and see and visit the relatives and hear all these things firsthand. Was that in 2017 when you went back over? Yes, it was 2017. That yes. So that, you know, a touching memory when we were in Preshov, it was getting to be the end of the day. And my cousin Pavel, who was kind of the ringleader for the tour, he started singing the Slovak song, Dobru noc ma mila, you know, good night, my dear. And I started singing it too. And we kept singing. And I thought he was going to leave and like they couldn't let go. He said, come on, we got to go and let's go get some pizza. It was getting dark and he just wanted to stick around and uh, be able to, to talk one of the other cousins interpreting. So there he was singing a song that I grew up with and I knew the words and was able to sing with him in person. And he just spontaneously had started singing it to say good night and goodbye. And we started singing it together. What a wonderful way to embrace your Slovak heritage. It's wonderful that even though you may not be completely fluent in, in Slovak, your parents introduced you through song and conversation to the language so that you're somewhat familiar with it, which is wonderful. Yes, yeah, so we had words that we used every day in the house that I never gave a thought to. Like growing up, I don't know, maybe it was high school to realize that a dish rag was called that because we always called it a pomitek. Both my mother and my father, my father who was descended of Ukrainian immigrants, his parents came from Galicia, also Austria-Hungary. He would call it pomitek. And the buja was the pantry, you know, bokanchi for shoes, okuliadis for glasses, you know, papuchi for our slippers. You know, with zimno, it's cold outside, you know, dojpade, you know, it's raining or snikpade, it's snowing. Various other things, uh, spots durendo, telling us it's time to go to bed, is some idiomatic expression that I, I think I said to some Slovaks and they didn't know what it was. They thought maybe it's just a shadish uh, saying <laughs> because the, the sh every region of Slovakia has its own dialect and certain things that even my mother said, I, I discovered, oh, this must be the shadish way of saying it rather than what might some call the standard Slovak. <laughs> right. And obviously you're going to pass that down to your children and it'll continue in future generations for your family. And that's a wonderful thing too. Well, it looks like we're just about out of time. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us? Uh, the only other thing you touched on food and we do the food quite a bit. I just made poplano last week. The kids love that. And my son went away to college and he made it for himself. Mahalushki skapusto, the dumplings with cabbage. He's made that for himself at college. We make that regularly, pirohi, kielbasa, various other things. You know, we make the uh, studzanina, and uh, they call it huspunina in Slovak now, pig's feet that you cook down and it becomes a gel, as aspic. A friend of mine usually visit over New Year's, and that's a dish that we, we always make. So we enjoy making the food together and passing on these family recipes and traditions my family and my siblings' families so that their children, grandchildren uh, can all continue to be aware of, you know, where they came from, so to speak. Mm. That's wonderful. It seems like traditional foods, recipes, and music is a universal language that transcends if, if someone doesn't speak fluently in the language, if they grow up enjoying them and learning to cook them and, and also some of the hymns, they can then continue to keep that part of the of the tradition and, and the family culture alive. I think that's great. Well, thank you, Father Matthew, for being here. Appreciate your sharing your story with us. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Dave. 
We hope you have enjoyed this episode of the Global Slovakia podcast. Theme music was composed and performed by Zoe Solar. Audio editor is Dea Partak. Global Slovakia is a non-for-profit organization founded and directed by Dr. Zuzana Palovic and Dr. Gabriela Beregaziova with the mission of sharing Slovakia with the world. If you like what you've heard, please donate at globalslovakia.com to help us continue to make this podcast possible. Thank you for listening and we hope you join us next time for the Global Slovakia podcast.